Greetings, nerds. This is Will Pulp, co-host and producer of the Cena Nerd Podcast with our host, Sarah Beaumont. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we have a special edition of Cena Nerd. We uh, are doing an interview show today with uh, Ro Moore, who is uh, uh, wears many hats, including as director, a script supervisor, uh, actress, producer, you name it, she's done it. So we're very, very excited to have her. She's going to be talking about her program, uh, her, her special her short coming up uh, called Undercover Wrestler. And uh, Ro, welcome to welcome to Senior Nerd. How are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you for having me. Great, great. Well, thank you for, for having us. I know our uh, mutual uh, social media, and I guess you know them in real life, acquaintances, uh, Geek Film Fest. Uh, you found us through, through them. We've worked with them and and they've been great partners and and uh, pushing out our podcast and uh on, on over the years and, and we appreciate them uh linking us together uh so that we can we can chat today about your project but uh one of the things i, I wanted to know is um you know you probably get the question you know where you are today how did you get here i want to know <laughs> what is your favorite Geek property. Oh my goodness. Okay, so geek property, I have to say Sin City. I okay. love the movie and that got me into the comic books and that got me into Quentin Tarantino, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, Sin City, like I know it's a little left field, but that would be my choice. Awesome, awesome. Well, it's 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 refreshing to hear someone not say a Marvel or DC thing. <laughs> right. Well, like here's the thing. Like I love Marvel and I love DC and everything they stand for. Um, I got to actually work with Stan Lee on uh, Jason Mew's uh, movie uh, Madness and the Method. Okay. So I got to meet the legend and got to talk to him. He's an incredible guy. But yeah, Sin City is is where it's at for me. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, that's, you know, I, Sin City is one of those properties that I will freely admit I never got fully into, but uh, it, it, like I said, it's really cool to to hear, uh, you know, again, such a diverse things that are out there. I mean, with, uh, you know, of course, the Marvels and the DCs, but we're getting things like Invincible. I know we've been really big. Uh, we're looking forward to the three-body problem that's going to be uh, dropping on, that uh, dropped on Netflix. Um, we're, we're looking forward, we're going to be checking that out and talking about it on our, on our podcast uh, and and looking through your resume and stuff. Tell us how you got into where you are today. I know you're originally from Colorado, correct? Yeah, so I'm born and raised from Denver, um, technically Aurora, which everybody now knows for the Dark Knight shooting. Mm -hmm. uh, but I started out there in a group called Colorado Actors Screenwriters Assembly, which no longer exists because this was almost two decades ago. This was 2006, 2007, so a long time ago. Wow. Um, and basically in that group, I did a competition or a challenge called Six Films in Six Months. And with that, we had to produce a short, the, we got a character, we got a genre, similar to the 48 Hour Film Festival, but you had to cast it, make it, edit it, and it would show in whatever stage it was in at the end of the month every month. So mm -hmm. it was really, a way to find out how do you make a film, what do you need to do in order to make it look good. Uh, yeah. And that really just got me going in the path of like, okay, well, I can produce this, I can make movies. And it was a, I guess, crash course for me huh. as far as a film school goes. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of filmmaking, and I know you're a director and you've written things and and, and been a producer. What what are some of your influences as far as filmmaking? I was looking at some of in, in preparing for this interview. I've, well, I watched some of your your prior work, and I was trying to really see. Uh, you know, I, I definitely got some of the the comedy. I was like, I, I was it reminded me of a lot of sketch comedy, like Upright Citizens Brigade and um, uh, Comedy Works, and some other other entity properties like that. But what what are some of your um, influences as far as your your approach to filmmaking? So my influences, I'm definitely more in the comedy world. So I'm glad you could pick that up because if not, and you're saying I'm drama, I'd be like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I have a background as a stand-up comedian. I was com comedian from like 2011 to 2013. Around mm -hmm. there, I did like the Comedy Store, Ice House, Laugh Factory, those guys. Um, and then I did Second City. So I'm a graduate of their conservatory program oh. for improv. 
Uh, and a lot of the people that I surround myself with are at UCB or Grambling, so we do a lot of comedy uh, in general, just because that's what life is. To us, it's easier to get through the craziness that's going on if you can just laugh at it. Um, but my influence is I love Edgar, Edgar Wright. I hmm. think he knows how to do comedy well. And it's interesting because I'm really studying up on the differences between American comedy and British comedy. Um, but the main difference is the physicality of what the comedy looks like on screen. So mm -hmm. that's, I love bringing that in. <laughs> cool, cool. So, uh, you know, when I think British comedy, of course, I think some of the more classics of uh, Monty Python uh, and, and and also, but uh, was, was that some of your some of your influences there as far as some of the classics or is it more more contemporary? So, yeah, it goes classics because when I was growing up, my mom would make us watch Are You Being Served? Okay. Um, on PBS and then Mr. Yeah. Bean. My oh, brother yeah. was obsessed with Mr. Bean. <laughs> so anyone yeah. on Atkinson that was physical, that could be like that hilarity of like the silence and the everything around the world is just against him. Um, so that's where that comes from. Yeah, yeah, I know, uh, and I know we'll talk about Undercover uh, Wrestler, but I know I was watching, um, I did watch the short uh, How We Met, the wedding, uh, building the website, and <laughs> what was your inspiration there? I mean, for, for folks who haven't watched it, you know, I'll make sure to drop uh, drop the link in our in the chat whenever uh, we when we release this, but uh, I, I just love the premise of the, the and I think about it with my wife too, as far as like when we tell the story about how we met, and you know, there's you know, over time, it uh, you know, things get embellished <laughs> or change, and and so when I was watching it, you know, hearing the characters talk about what they saw, but then you juxtapose that with what actually happened, it was just it was super funny. So, tell me a little bit more about that project. So, how we met came about, so I'm in a uh, comedy group called Gold Comedy. And there's something called Digital Teams that's a branch of that where we go and we make a film or comedic sketch every month. And how we met was started because Lee, who was the writer on it, has a fear of getting married. And we were just like, why are you so afraid? And she's like, because what if it's the wrong person for me? And what do I do about that? And so she wrote the sketch to highlight how everybody needs to be politically correct when they write their How We Met story. And I took it and went, okay, this can be the most boring interactions, but how do I make these boring interactions something that people will want to watch and laugh at? So yeah. the hot guy montage that I love so much with the girls like fainting over the guy and the fact that they can never get on the same page. I love the bathroom scene where she comes out of the shower and he's just like, what are we? And she's like, I don't know. You tell me I have a date tonight. And like, I have purposely left the viewer being like, is it a date because they're on a date or does she yeah. have a completely different date now she's using him? So yeah. it's a lot of fun. Yeah, that, that that scene does stick out to me as well. I mean, the ambiguity there when I when I watched it and I, and I did yeah uh, and I, you know I don't want to spoil it too much for anyone who goes to see it, but uh, it, it definitely like I was like, hmm hmm. So, if uh, you know, spoiler alert, uh, folks, if you haven't watched it, Paul's here now. I'll tell you when to come back. But for those folks who have watched it, tell me. You know, I know a lot of you know, many times creators on these podcasts will you know share what their the what their interpretation or, or uh, intention was for it. And it could, if it, if it's supposed to be ambiguous, you know, for for you to say so, but. Was it supposed to be, or is there more going on there? Especially given what happens later in the film, with the uh, with the sal the salsa lesson. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I mean, it's purposely meant to be ambiguous to see like okay. is she cheating on him with the hot guy, or is it like yeah. the hot guy just becomes a really good friend of theirs? Like okay. it was meant to be ambiguous. <laughs> okay. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, coming back, coming back since we've got out of spoiler land to to the project. So, um, you, you've you've had many jobs, and I, and I know we're here to talk about undercover wrestler. But while I had you, um, one of the things you've done has been a script supervisor. And uh, looking at your IMDb, that's and your website, that seems to be a a pretty big part of your career. And I and I had the opportunity to in preparing to listen to you talk about your path uh, to that 
career, that part of your career, uh, how you got there. And if you maybe could give a, you know, a quick 30 second or so, you know, summary as far as how you ended up being a script supervisor. But, you know, one, tell our listeners and watchers, you know, what's, what is a script supervisor? How much, uh, what, you know, you know, as part of that, what, um, you know, role you have there as far as keeping things on track. I know, like, uh, I know, like, I was listening to script supervisor of Star Trek. They really talked about how, in their role, actors can't go off script. But given your background in improv, you know, the projects you've worked on, you know, do you have that some flexibility? So I'd love to hear hear from your perspective on on, on what your role in that is and um, and how you got there. For sure. So script supervising, I'm essentially on set making sure that what's written in the script is what we are capturing on the camera. So that way in the editing room, they can put it all together and follow along as far as what the story is, what the characters are doing, what they're saying. And then um, I not only do that, but I also make sure that everything can cut together. So if someone happens to pick up like a coffee or a cup in one hand, they stay consistent with that hand. Uh, that way it's not all of a sudden, hey, the cup's here, the cup's there. I'm sure everybody loves those goofs in the movies when they're like, ah, yeah. got that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's what my role has been primarily for the most of my career in the entertainment industry. And I have been lucky enough to work on a lot of projects that have the comedy and the improv where they can go up on lines. They can, uh, one movie that I did called Entertainment, which I think screened at Sundance in 2014, 2015, somewhere around there. Um, that one, I literally was handed an outline of like, this is what we want to have happen in this section. This is what happens in this section. So the actors were literally told to come in and say, okay, whatever you want to say, it just needs to be within these parameters. And I was responsible for tracking what they said, the subjects that in the order that they said them in, what was funny, what didn't work. And they really workshopped the scene while I while we were on set filming it. And by like take six or seven, we knew what the scene was and they kind of kept to the same lines roughly. Um, yeah, but yeah. when you're doing that, you learn so much about what works in the story arc, what do you need in a scene, how does the director, because I'm sitting right next to them as a script supervisor, how do they wrangle in when something goes too far off the block, and how do they okay. uh, make sure that the actors feel confident in what they're being told and said, so that way they can perform without these like subconscious mind of theirs going, this sucks, this sucks. Uh, so it's a, it's a freeing opportunity, but it is a challenge to be in that role. Yeah, yeah. Uh, are, are, there, are there some projects where, is it one of those things that depends on the director as far as like how much freedom the actors have with those type of situations or, uh, or is it, um, or is it really, like the project will lend itself to it so that, you know, some projects like you, as one you just noted, you know, basically give it a blank script then you all just riff on it or, you know, or if it, you know, or if it's one that is a very regimented script, but, you know, have a little bit of flexibility, but not much, you know, what really drives that as, as you're going through production? Cause time is money um, yes. when, when you're, when you're working on these things. And uh, it, it especially I'm sure, you know, uh, I mean, I'm sure you've worked on mega billion, million dollar projects, but also very, you know, shoestring budget projects as well. Yeah, dollar budgets. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, really what dictates how long you have and how strict you have to be to the lines is really the network of the outlet. So if you're doing network TV, particularly sitcoms, you have to be on the mark with your lines because mm -hmm. the rhythm is there. They write it in a very specific manner of like, even if there's three items in a dialogue, so like, oh, the rigatoni, the macaroni, the linguine, like they specifically wrote it in that order. So you have to say it with that intention and with that order. Um, they also time it specifically for TV. So they can't be over 22 minutes or 22, 30 seconds on half hours, 44 minutes on one hours, because if you go over, then the advertisers lose their time or they end up having to start the other programming late, or you're gonna get cut off at the end. It just is what it is. So it just really depends on the strictness of the outlet. And sometimes feature films fall under this too. I've noticed that sometimes like Netflix will say, okay, we're expecting a 92 minute film. And if you don't turn in a 92 minute film, we're gonna have issues. But that's where it becomes a little bit of how strict you have to be with that script. 
Um, and then it comes back to the director. Like if they feel there's a certain pace, if there's a certain tone, if there's a certain reaction or performance that they want from the actor, they may say, okay, this scene's going to be slower than the rest of them. Let's actually build something here and show the relationship. And then later on we can make it da 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 So, yeah, it's really up to that vision after that. Cool, cool. Um, I know also uh, you've had the opportunity to work on many projects like um, uh, Master of Delusion, as far as speaking of networks, and and I think uh, I think you also mentioned RuPaul's uh, Drag Race as yes. well. Yeah, <laughs> I love RuPaul. Oh my god. Yeah. Uh, I've worked on their show three times. Um, it's always been for the reunion and finale episodes, so I don't get the drama leading up to it, but we get okay. to see the drama unfold in the reunion and the finale. Um, but when I'm working on those shows, it's a totally different land because that's unscripted. So mm -hmm. nothing is like other than, okay, we know in Act 1, we're going to ask these questions. Act 2, we're going to ask these questions. And at least so-and-so is going to perform at this Act 3 or like commercial break situations. Yeah. Um, but those are the funnest because you really have no idea what might unfold. Mm. It's at the will of the people <laughs> in front of the camera. Um, and then just being ready, if, should something go awry or crazy, to just run with it. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Well, speaking of uh, unscripted and scripted productions and stuff, and we're now several months removed from, from the strikes. Um, really wanted to get... Mm -hmm. uh, it, Get your thoughts on several things with that, especially being someone who 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 works in the industry. Uh, one, just I, I, I know uh, you're part of the the Directors Guild of America, mm -hmm. and y'all were fortunate enough to, you know, get a, your deal done before you know. I think it was sort of in between when the writers struck and when the actors went on strike. Yeah. Um, uh, but looking at that, what are some of the things you you could see? You know, let's take it. You know, we got we got a relative labor harmony. I know there's things going on with other guilds right now with the many animators and other stuff, but we have relative. We're going to have somewhat harmony for the next three years. But yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but looking ahead, and especially someone who's into industry, uh, I'm very curious to know um, what things. Uh, one, do you think these just the, the, for all the three major guilds? Uh, do you think they're one? It was what were these good deals for the industry, especially given the landscape we're seeing how uh, studios are go are sort of at a crossroads where we're hearing things like Paramount thinking of, you know, maybe getting it acquired by someone and Warner's, yeah. you know, going through a lot of fluidity as well and some of the others. So I was one very curious, you know, for, for both sides, both for the from the studio perspective as well as the performer and cast, you know, and crew and line perspective. Um, do you think those these work agreements were, were good for the industry? I mean, on a lot of levels, yes, because even in the last negotiations three years ago, there were a lot of things that got dropped. And it was mainly because the new media aspect. It's not necessarily new media anymore. It was back in 2010. It was back in 2012. But it's got an established reputation now, and it has an established audience. So the fact that we had to wait this long to push through a lot of the um, requirements and the contractual agreements, I mean, it was necessary at this point. <laughs> um, I think that we did, the WGA definitely got a really good contract, and I think they pushed a lot of things forward that will help uh, future generations and any future negotiations to make sure there's a precedent set and that there's expectations to continue the pipeline because there's not really the one thing that they were hoping to fix is the pipeline of how to become like a staff writer to being a showrunner to like getting in the positions and having the diversity of shows that we had in the 80s and 90s where it wasn't all Chuck Lorre or all yeah. Seth MacFarlane and that that's all you get. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully that got fixed. SAG, I believe, did also, but I've started digging into their contract a little bit more, and there's some things that I think they left crumbs on the table, but a yep. lot of SAG will say, you know, they negotiated hard, and that was, it was a struggle to get to what they get got to. So I admire yeah. them, and anybody that's on the negotiation teams, especially with IOTC, because I'm also local 871 script supervisor, um, it's no easy feat. It's no, like, yeah. you got to go toe-to-toe, -to -toe and that's hard when you need to consider everybody's living uh, expenditures, especially with L.A. being 
on the rise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, one one of the things you mentioned there about the breadcrumbs being left on the table, and also I'd love to hear your perspectives as far as I'd see and some of the others, because I know people really focus on the big guild, you know, the relatively big guilds. But uh, just thinking of looking ahead to twenty twenty six when these deals are uh, will come up again, what are some of those breadcrumbs? That, I know you mentioned you're an IADC member. Or, or, I don't know if you have your side card or not, but um, what um, what um, breadcrumbs you see that could be potential landmines when we when we get to 2026 that that were left on the table one and then yeah. two as, as you mentioned um you know, other other unions that uh, are are you know, have a role in the in, in the industry um what are some things that could be done to help protect folks because i know one of the big things that was you know that was often lo lost out in the discussions last year was all the uh, below the line staff who were impacted by the by the uh, by these strikes yeah and i mean that's been a big part of it so first i think the breadcrumbs that remain that in 2026 will be a lot different is ai mm -hmm. i think that's just a known for across not just our industry as the entertainment industry but as like a worldwide phenomena of like how do we handle this and how do we restrict it in manners that are ethical and not cost people jobs the one thing i keep telling everybody and sorry if this is controversial but who said i wanted my job replaced by a computer mm. and, and i don't recall putting that inquiry out there the <laughs> um but it is it seems like that's the one goal of ai is to be like well we can replace all these humans jobs well great but how do i make money now right. and how do i survive knowing that this computer like it's a whole thing with me because I, I I'm artistic for a reason. I'm doing mm. directing, I'm doing storytelling and things like that. My mind cannot wrap its head around yeah. sitting in front of a computer and reading code. Right. So like my biggest battle, and again, sorry to get off my soapbox, but my no, no. is I don't want to say that there's a ton of jobs created because the jobs that are being created are the people that are going to be sitting and reading the code. Mm. It's not going to be creating me as a creator and storyteller jobs as far as what I want to do and pursue is in the industry. But yeah. I think AI will look a lot different in 2026. We'll see, maybe it'll be like 3D movies and it'll show up for three movies and then it'll ride off into the silent sunset and we'll forget yeah. that AI was involved in movie making. <laughs> right, right. Do you, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. just to pick on the AI point for a second row, um, you know, given your role as a script supervisor, and I'm sure you're probably very sensitive to these things. What, yeah. and I, and I, you, you touched on it some, but um, have you seen, especially now, um, we're back, you're back to work and stuff in, in the in the scripts and stuff. Are you seeing it more, utilized more? Because I mean, you can, it, yes, generative AI has, it has has come has made quantum leaps in innovation here uh, over right. since it's really been utilize more since chat but uh are you finding more that sort of script sprinkled in for you know from where you can sell a human script writer from the machine script writer or i mean i i don't have the i wish i could go behind the curtain and see really what's happening but i do know there's been word that ai and generative ai founders are meeting with hollywood studio representatives to say here's how we can help uh I, it has been mentioned i think like wb that you're using AI to scan a script before they send it off to a reader, which I think is unfortunate because mm. I've used, a, I've tampered with it. I've been like, all right, what's this thing? Um, yeah. But it's not human enough to understand, like, and be able to dissect and read between the lines. It's just giving mm. you the facts, which is great, but storytelling is not the facts. It's the all the in between and the gray. So we'll see. Um, I do know that a couple, like my storyboarding friends are very concerned um, because anybody, there's something called Previs Pro and I can create animated little things and I can do my own storyboarding now and I don't have to hire a storyboard artist if mm -hmm. I know how to use the program. Um, and it's great. I'm excited to see where it will fall and have its shortcomings, but it's, it's gonna affect a lot of different departments. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and, it, and that's why I really wanted to get your perspective on it because you know, on our podcast, we you know we're we're, we're talking about the finished product, and after it's gone through the the 
production and being made and we're you know we're, we're reacting to what we see on the screen but i mean i think it you know i really wanted to give creatives like yourself the opportunity to really um you know we've gotten this you know because it's one of those things for me as a consumer it just seemed like the strikes happened everybody's back to work and folks aren't really talking about it anymore but yeah. I know, but, you know, but having followed it and knowing that, you know, this is really just, you know, these are three year blocks. And, and it seems that while overall seeing most people were generally happy, you know, well, I won't say happy, but maybe satisfied with what came out of it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I did want to get your perspective as someone who is working in the industry to see what things, you know, what potential stumbling blocks could be happening. And will we be back at this place again um, in, in just a short time? <laughs> Yeah, we'll see. Fingers yeah. crossed. Yeah. Hopefully we don't have to go through another multi-month strike in three years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and to that point, what are some of the things that you think if, if God forbid that that does happen again, what can be done to help uh, some of those folks? Beyond it's like, you know, unemployment, those types of things, but uh, that can be done to to really um, help creatives when they're when they're going through whenever these negotiations are, are going through that process and um, being protected. Uh, I feel like it's sort of like the, our government where you're like going through their shutdowns. It's like the poor workers are the ones who are hurt while the games are being made by these people off, yeah. off, off the far, line, far away land. <laughs> Not yeah. to get political or anything, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, because it got, I think it got struck down that strike pay isn't gonna happen. So that's mm -hmm. already one protection that we could continue to fight for. But I know like I'm very proactive as a person so I'm already looking like, okay, how do I diversify my income? Like, is it whether I go into another industry and like um, buy or like claim a uh, business that's like lawn care or something like that and really invest in that a little bit so I have a balance between two items, one that's more volat volatile and then one that's more stable. Um, a lot of my friends are looking at transitioning like that or finding a way that our skill set and the industry does translate to the real world because um, mm -hmm. we always call it the real world. We're, we know we're the circus over here, <laughs> but the land of make believe. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but we really are trying to find ways. Like as a script supervisor, I'm very detail oriented. I know um, I'm very quick to analyze data, so I can do quality control. So a lot of us are trying to find ways to balance that. But the fear that is coming up with that, and I say fear in a really, fear is the bad, wrong word. It's a bad word for it. But the idea is, is that filmmaking will now become a side hobby for a lot of us because we have to pay attention to the stability. And that's not what we want. We love that what we do and what our passion is pays our bills, pays our um, lifestyles and everything like that. We don't want to say, oh, hey, I have this opportunity to work on this Marvel film, but I can't because my day job. Like that, that's not what we want to do. And so it's really a challenge to navigate that and find a perfect balance for everyone that when a strike happens again, we can prepare for it better and financially not be uh, at a loss like a lot of us are right now. Cool. Yeah. Well, hopefully uh, a lot of lessons were learned, uh, you know, but also hopefully uh, – when we get to the next round of negotiations, things will, won't get to this place where uh, there'll be any stoppages and people can continue their livelihoods and their passions because, um, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely a mix of both uh, with, with, uh, with any industry that you're in. Um, in the time we have left, I know, uh, again, we, you're here to talk about uh, your uh, latest project, uh, which I see is in post-production, uh, according to IMDb, uh, Undercover Wrestler. So tell us all about that and um, and when we ex when we can we expect it to be released. Yeah, of course. So Undercover Wrestler, woo! Um, it's got a catchy theme song. It's kind of a music video meets a regular action comedy film. Uh, it follows a guy named Undercover who likes to come around and pops out of nowhere on small stupid injustices so forget your turning your blinker undercover is going to show up um in this episode i guess we could call it our short film uh it's basically a, leonard decides to steal his sister's crinkle cut french fries and he gets the smack down <laughs> um, but we are very much looking forward it'll uh world premiere at the pasadena film festival on april 7th so we're oh, forward to that and then it will be touring with geek fest oh, nice awesome so 
Yeah, we're super stoked. Um, Joseph, who plays undercover wrestler and wrote it, uh, Joseph Daly, he is mm -hmm. looking forward to touring with Geek Fest and being at a table. We're making a comic book side to it. So oh, he'll wow. be right there to meet the guy. And if you want to know more of what's going on, we plan to develop this out a little bit further. Awesome. Awesome. So, uh, so I know you, you directed this, this project, correct? Yes. Yes. I did. <laughs> Yeah, and I saw it on your demo reel. I saw the the the, the incident with the crinkle cut fry. So, tell me, what what sort? Of, why the crinkle cut fry? I mean, I, and I think you know you touched on it earlier in our, in our discussion after this afternoon, and uh, some of the comedy and just how life situations just sometimes are just funnier than anything you can script out. But tell me, what was the sort of driving motivation and force behind this this project? So Joseph Daly came to me with this group called Comedy Whoops, or Whoops Comedy, and they had a whole bunch of shorts that I was like, hey, well, I'd love to direct some of these. Um, let me take a look and see what you got. And I fell in love because, first of all, it's physical comedy. Yeah. And I grew up watching uh, WWE uh, with my brother. I didn't watch it as much as my brother, but I know who Triple H <laughs> is, and I know The Rock. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My dad was a huge fan of Hulk Hogan and, like, Same. So when I read it, I was like, oh, no, this this hits too many of my heartstrings. And I'm just like, oh, I love this. I love this. And one of my great friends, Ann Westcott, is a stunt coordinator here. So I was like instantly, boom, we've got the team. We can make this happen. Um, but I loved it because it is over such a small injustice. And that's what com makes the best comedy is when it's like, really? Like when you want Larry <laughs> David do something stupid, you just go, how in your mind is that? Okay, <laughs> what in the world allows the world around you to just respond like in that manner? So we took it to that extreme of like, well, if it's just as simple as crinkle cut fries and you steal them, of course you're going to get the throw down. Um, so it was a lot of fun to put that together. And we had rehearsals leading up to it that were uh, navigating the different movements. We do with something from wrestling called the power bomb. Mm -hmm. which if you've ever watched it, it's apparently the most difficult move in wrestling to do. Uh, yeah. And like a lot of the wrestlers train up to do it and we pulled it off on camera in full of wides. So in all its glory. So. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so, uh, so, so were you director slash stunt coordinator? <laughs> oh no, I leave the stunt coordinating to Anne Westcott. Okay. She was amazing. And then we had Alyssa Ratau from Women of Wrestling that came on board to help oh, with nice. the wrestling coordination. Um, so between the two of those ladies, by the way, all female stunts team, that doesn't happen awesome. very often. <laughs> yeah, that's true, that's true. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, they handled a lot of how the movements would. I just oversaw okay, so we need to have this move take them from the booth to the open area. So that way we can do whatever we want and we're not restricted by the space and then um, how we were going to capture it on camera. So like making sure that the hits looked real and that the camera angle uh, gave the comedy feel to it. Like there's a ch moment in there where undercover is like ducking and missing the punches from Leonard and just having him come up and make faces and be like, ha ha, you missed me there. Um, <laughs> All of that was just like a culmination of what me, Anne, and Alyssa all built together to make it um, yeah. on the screen. As, as a director, uh, was, was this was this probably was this a one of your more um, challenging projects to, to direct because of integrating the story? You know, you got the wrestling, you got the the, the physical aspect of it. I know you're, you we you used yeah. the physical comedy, but. Uh, but probably getting the right angles and stuff, so it, you know, so it hits right. I mean, was what, what were some of the challenges for you as a director? Uh, oh my gosh! So <laughs> I'm lucky because I got to work on a sh couple seasons of a show called Lucha Underground, which okay. I don't know if this is in the nerd world as much, but it was a wrestling show uh -huh. that showcased luchadors and their wrestling and their different personalities. So um, I got to watch Skip Chase and figure out how to do the stunts and we had three cameras on that project. So yeah. when I decided to do Undercover Wrestler, I only had theater plays under my belt. I maybe shot oh. one other thing, but it was like so simple talking head style. And I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was really a little in over my head when I came into 
<laughs> I was confident on the outside, but on the inside, I was like, oh shit. <laughs> but yeah, no, it was one of the more challenging. We had three cameras on set, just like Lucha, mm -hmm. and it was a matter of how do we cover this because we didn't want to tire out our actors and have them do it repeatedly. Um, right. It was hard. Um, especially since Joseph's not a trained wrestler and him mm. playing the undercover wrestler, I didn't want to be like, all right, take 25. Let's yeah, do yeah. <laughs> so, um, it was just a lot of discussion and me and my DP Ray Hastings, who's an amazing queer uh, camera operator, DP cinematographer. Yeah. Um, we came up with strategies of how to put the cameras in different areas that would allow us to get the wide at the same time as the close-up oh. at the same time as like the movement of the camera to be able to mm -hmm. transition between the hits so awesome that's cool so i know it's, it's premiering at the at the with the, at the pasadena um film fest correct pasadena international film festival film festival yeah <laughs> so uh will you have any distribution um beyond the as far as on youtube or or other other mediums where we stream streamers or anything where we can for people who can't make it to, to california to yeah to, to, to see mean, this yeah and obviously at the different geek fest uh conventions will be there and then after that we are seeking opportunities so if anybody is listening we'd love to do that before we just release it to the world on youtube and see if we can get it maybe on roku or shorts tv those kinds of outlets so everybody can enjoy the insanity that is undercover wrestler Awesome. Awesome. Well, good luck with that. Hopefully uh, you'll get great feedback and a lot of folks, whenever they have the, the screeners at the cons, I know um, that's always, um, I, I know we have our local Durham Comic Con and they always have um, opportunities for, for not only the well-known things, but also for, for smaller projects as well and the breakout sessions. So, yeah. I, I, you know, w hope, it goes very, very well, and hopefully the, the Roku's and um, and the streamers of the world can you know can can pick it up and and, and get it to a much wider wider distribution because um, you, know, uh, you know again as we talked about earlier it's great for the big big things but you know yeah. we we want to support our our small and independent filmmakers as well exactly that way we can keep making it and then kind of not use it but take over the studio system. <laughs> <laughs> there we yeah, there we go. Get some get some diversity and not everything has to be a, a big comic book uh, 200 million blockbuster. <laughs> yes, in the yeah. words of the academy speech like make 10 yeah. 20 mi million or maybe take 25 yeah. million dollars. <laughs> like yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. A a a exactly, exactly. Well, great. Well, anything uh, would you would like to share with us here? I mean, I know I've asked you a bunch of questions, but uh, it, before we close out, any anything you would like to share with our listeners and watchers that uh, you have coming up on the horizon or uh, as far as upcoming films or projects or uh, things that you can talk about that's not covered under N NDA? <laughs> I know, right? Um, well, yeah. We have been working on another short film that I think your nerds might be interested in. It's called Death by Chocolate, and it's a good oh. horror comedy about a girl who's allergic to chocolate oh. and rose petals. Ooh. And she gets tempted and put through the ringer, similar to Saw, of like, well, oh. if I can't scare you in the normal ways, will rose petals scare you? So that'll be fun yeah. to do this year. Um, cool. And then, yeah, we just look forward to a lot more of the undercover showing at different festivals, and I'm hoping We'll have more on the horizon as far as a feature film. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. Well, well, Ro, I, I really, really enjoyed this conversation. And I, I hope you can come back to uh, to join us again here on the podcast. Maybe our host, Sarah, will be able to join as well. I'm sure she'll probably have a bunch of questions. But uh, mm -hmm. tell us, uh, where, tell everyone where they can find you. I know and where can they can find your, your production company is uh, Pi Pi Productions. Yep, Pi Pi Productions. Um, so we are most on Instagram. So you can find right. us at Pi Pi Prod. So that's P I E P I E Prod P R O D. Or you can find myself. I'm Ro underscore Mo M O. So that's where we're most at. If not, you can go on to Pi Pi Productions dot net, and that will have all of our uh, projects listed up there. Where you can find us next, um, what's developing, and everything from there. 
Awesome. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for your time. I, I, I greatly appreciate it. Great, great talking with you here today and, and learning more about your, your career and some of the things going on. And also, uh, you know, someone who is inside the industry's perspective on, on, on things that uh, we, we've seen in the, over the last few months and, and, and wish you all the best with uh, success with Undercover Wrestler. It's, it's going through the geek circuit and, um, and, and, and future projects as well. So, and you can, yeah, thanks. So thank you for being here. Thank uh, you. And you can find, we'll have this podcast uh, wherever you get your podcast. And you can find that by going to our website at www.seenandnerdpodcast.com. You can find us on all the podcast channels, uh, platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcast.